All right, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to the first official class after the holidays. First class of 5780. No, 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 we did classes after Yom Kippur. First class in Cheshvan. Uh, very exciting. Back at the return of the Parsha chat. Uh, but because of a uh, special request by long longtime attendee uh, and current co host Lauren Blatt, um, there was a fantastic topic. Lauren sent me a very fun email. Um, actually, I think we chatted about it briefly at, at, at Minion 2, and she asked, what about Noah's wife? Right? Noah's wife, such a pivotal character, literally, the, the, the mother of a new world, and yet she does not have a name. And there's a lot of scholarship, actually, about how uh, a name, especially in Torah and other ancient literatures, isn't just like a you know, a random designation. It's not just like what someone happens to call you, but it says something very important about who you are and what you're about. And um, we'll actually see examples of that later in the class. Uh, so what does it what does it say that Noah's wife uh, does not have a name? Now, um, I want to propose in a way a midrashic mystical exploration or explanation. One example, one reason is because maybe she was ancillary to the intent of the Torah. But I, that's, I find that hard to believe. Um, I, I humorously characterized Midrash before as a typically Jewish literature in the sense that it cannot tolerate silence. So whenever it sees something that's missing, it always wants to make sure to fill, fill, fill with, uh, with something. Um, you know, it's like Jews like to actively listen. And by that, what we mean is uh, interrupt a lot. Um, yes, very good point. Very good point in the chat that, uh, as we will see very, very shortly, but very apt to point out, Noah's sons are listed. Shem, Cham, V'yafet, right? Uh, I'm not sure how to translate those names. Um, but Noah's wife is not fast, and also their wives are also not, um, are also not mentioned. Um, so we are going to explore how a number of different oral traditions, beginning before the rabbis, very spookily, and then entering into Midrash, and then Kabbalah, and even dabbling a little bit, because I can never resist, even a little bit of Hasidut, even a little bit of Hasidism. We're going to see how actually Noah's wife is uh, not just a matter of importance, but a matter of, of, of central concern. And in this, I think it, it evinces what I would call also a mystical hermeneutic, a, a mystical way of, of interpreting and reading the text. By which I mean, um, all of God's names in the Kabbalist tradition, which are associated with the Sfirot, appear in different places in the Torah, except for one, uh, the name Ein Sof, which is not really a name, it's more like an essence, or something beyond essence. Ein Sof does not appear at all in the Torah, and one of the crit critics of Kabbalah say, ah, so you're just making it up, you're just saying God is Ein Sof. And the Kabbalists say, no, actually, its holiness is, proof, is proved by the fact that it, it's only hidden. Right? The fact that it is completely hidden means actually it's the most transcendent aspect of God, it's something that is beyond or prior to language. So, I'm not saying Noah's wife is ain't so, but Noah's wife's being missing is, act, is, not, is not a defect, it's not a bug, but it's a feature. It is the way that the Midrashic engines uh, rev, it's the way that the Jewish uh, reading practice uh, is juiced. So, let's dig into it. Uh, I'm going to share a screen. Can everyone see that okay? Groovy. Okay. So, uh, it's a class called Mother of a New World on Noah's Wife. Um, and uh, I don't know, it's, I saw actually, Susie mentioned before, Madeline LaEngel is an example of modern Midrash. Um, I think in, in one of the sequels to um, to the, the book, the is it in Swiftly Tilting Planet or is it in one of the other ones? I forget. Um, but uh, another modern midrash in uh, one of the Bill and Ted movies, um, he's, they are asked, who is Joan of Arc? And they say, Noah's wife, and that's a very good joke, because she was in an ark. Okay, so Noah's wife, this is from another modern midrash, a beautiful collection of poems called Ladies of Genesis by, uh, by a, a Jewish feminist named Barbara Hollander. She writes, Noah's wife is mentioned only in passing, and never named. We are told she entered the ark and departed with Noah. But she must have done something all that time. Perhaps she was a poet, and we're going to see actually why that's a very apt suggestion, and spoke in rhymed couplets, and I love this, two by two. 
So everything in Noah is working two by two. But for her, as we'll see later, she is uh, Noah's wife might be tapped into the literary creative arts. Uh, but the point that Hollander is making here is that um, that there is, I think, in a way, Noah becomes an especial um, object of Jewish feminist concern because it's an example of ways in which, let's say, Jewish women's or women's in general presence in history tends to be not front and center, but tends to be found either in margins or hidden. This is why Joan Scott and other uh, histo feminist historians have called uh, per the, the practice of women's or feminist history is a re practice of recovery of trying to recover something that has been missing or lost. And in a way, and this is a especially interesting conjunction because women's feminist project in, in Jewish liter literature culture tends to conjoin with Midrash because Midrash is also a recovery-based project. It is also trying to recover something that is present but not obvious. It is, it is hidden. It is esoteric. Okay. Uh, and besides Kabbalah, which is an esoteric recovery practice as well. Something is new because it is old. Um, you recover the ancient wisdom. Okay, so it says, let's start. Eilet toldot Noach. Noach, right? These are the generations of Noach. Noach, ish tzadik tamim hayav adoratav, is a righteous man, innocent in his generation. As Jin's the famous question of like, what if he was in a different generation, would he, would he have been a good guy? Interesting question, but we'll bracket that for now because this isn't about Noah. This is about Noah's wife. Um, et ha'elokim hitalech Noach. Noah walked with God. Okay, that's pretty cool. Vayolad Noach shloshavanim, and here to uh, Ariel's point before, three children uh, had he, Shem, Ham, and Yafet. Now, who's missing? Because uh, we can all assume, by the way, that Noah did not have children by himself. Noah's wife is missing. She's not even mentioned. She's not even mentioned when, when Noah is mentioned. Uh, so then we dip a little bit down before. Vayomer Hashem Noach. God said to Noah, Bo ata v'chol beitcha el teva. You and your entire household, in a rabbinic idiom, by the way, household often refers to not just your children, and your but it refers specifically actually to your spouse, to the ark. Ki otcha ra'iti tzadik lefanai bedor hazeh. Because I saw you being righteous, before me in this generation. Ah, you, otcha, that's in the singular. So again, Noah seems to be the focus, and his household is mentioned ancillarily. Dot, dot, dot. Vayavo Noah uvanav ishto unneshevanav. Noah, his children, his wife, and their wives all came, all entered the ark, mipnei mehamabul, just before the waters came. Again, a little quick last aside about Noah. Actually, it says that's actually how we know that Noah maybe wasn't so righteous. Was that because he was he was he maybe believed the flood was coming, maybe didn't, and he dithered until the flood actually started until it started raining for him to actually go into the ark. Um, so here there's Noah. There's Noah's wife. Ah, but we're still missing the question. Um, what was her name? We don't know, right? So that's going to be the the hook of this class. Fine, Noah's wife gets mentioned, but she just gets mentioned. She gets mentioned in, in a referential way, right? She's referred to. She is indexical, right? She is pointed out. She is not named. Is she just an object of the text's concern, or does she have some kind of sense of subjectivity, right? Does she have some kind of sense of being a character in her own right? That is what we're going to discover. That's what we're going to dig into. Okay, now, here is where um, this class is not allowed to be viewed by any... Uh, anyone who's going to rat me out. But here we're going to explore some of the Apocrypha and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So this is why you really get the really fun stuff in this class. Um, so, it says, this is the Book of Jubilees. And the Book of Jubilees is a, a, a second temple-based attempt to um, expand the Book of Breshit and to explore it in a cosmic way. It really digs into these early mystifying chapters, the ones that, in, for instance, in chapter 5, feature the sons of God who couple with human women. We'll actually see that later. There's all this wild stuff happening. It is a companion book of sorts to the book of uh, Enoch and the book of Watchers, um, which are also these cosmic accounts of Genesis. It's called the Book of Jubilees because, given a cosmic account, it is actually trying to 
give a chronology of what's happening in a jubilee cycle, in a cycle of 50 years. So we'll see here. In the fifth, in the 25th jubilee, so 25 times 5, whoever wants to do the math for me, sorry, 25 times 50, whoever wants to do the math for me there, it's 125. Uh, wait, no, it's a 1250. Yeah. Um, Noah Isha. Noah took a wife. Okay. Ushma Emtsara. And her name was Emtsara. Aho, so she does have a name according to Sefer Hayovel. Um, very, very interesting. So her name is Emtsara. Now, interestingly, and here's actually especially for all you language nerds, Tsadi and Sin are both sibilant letters, and because of that, often switch. So Emtsara probably means something like mother of princesses, or maybe mother of, eventually, dot, 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 Sarah. Uh, and she's the daughter of Rakiel, Bat Achoto, Loli Isha, Bat Achoto. So we're going to bracket whether it's cool or not, but uh, so if she's the Bat, Bat Achoto, Rakiel is the, there, there's some kind of like cousin relationship, we can't quite figure it out. Bishna Rishana Bishvua Hamishi, right. So in the seventh, in the fifth cycle there. Um, so here we have Noah's wife being uh, given, being nominated, right? She, she has a name. Book of Jubilees is from Second Temple period Judea. Um, it is, it's part of what's called the Apocrypha, uh, which means books that were not canonized. And one of the most famous examples of that, which the rabbis actually sometimes cite from in the Talmud, is Ben Sira, which is a wisdom book of sorts, kind of similar to the book of Proverbs. Um, in the Wisdom of Solomon, another apocryphal book. There's a whole collection of books. Uh, book of Maccabees, also apocryphal. Not included in the Tanakh, but written in the Second Temple period. Um, book of Jubilee is probably associated with some kind of priestly school, because it's especially concerned about the Temple. Um, okay, so I I'm gonna, I'm gonna re-contextualize uh, these in a minute. Um, but here comes one from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which is from uh, Qumran, uh, a, a series of caves near the Dead Seas. It's a question whether all of these scrolls are part of one group or a bunch of different groups, um, but they are an example of what is in the air in a, another priestly-oriented group in the Second Temple period. Okay, the, written most likely sometime in the 2nd century BCE. So this is from a text called the Genesis Apocryphon, which is, again, an expanded version of Breshi, um, from Colloquy 6, it says. Then I, Noach, became an adult. Well done. Shkoyach. I held firmly to righteousness, and I took hold. Uh, the text is... Uh, uh, corrupted is the wrong word. The text is in fragmentary form. So whenever you see these dots, it means that stuff is missing. And um, Sarah, his daughter, I took as my wife. So, again, we have Bata Choteau up there. Uh, his daughter probably meaning Rakiel, if it's the same tradition. So we have agreement between these two Second Temple period sources that Noah's wife does have a name, and her name is Amtsara. Okay, now, what does this mean? Um... So I want to I want to bracket true in a sense. I want to bracket the question of true, because we're going to see other versions of what we think her name is. So this is, and here's me recontextualizing this. When we look at texts like the Apocrypha, Book of Jubilees, Dead Sea Scrolls, etc., I think we can look at them as being part of what we can call a larger oral tradition. All right, these are oral traditions that are used to help us understand the written Torah. Now, they are coming from a non-rabbinic or pre-rabbinic groups, right? Before the rabbinic movement got started. All right, so this is before the Common Era. And, but I want to say, like other oral Torah, like Midrash, the question of truth is by necessity suspended. Because the most important phrase in Midrash is the phrase davar acher. Namely, we have different 
takes, right? The hot take industrial complex did not start with the internet. It started with Midrash. This rabbi has a theory, and that rabbi has a theory, and this rabbi, and then they often contradict each other. I think it's a productive framing to understand oral Torah, Midrash, is poetry. Like the poetry we saw to begin this class. It is not a question of accuracy. And I would say in some ways, I don't think the rabbis, uh, when we see it, need it to be accurate. Because if it, they did, then they wouldn't let so many contradictory things come out in the Midrash. Midrash is not about accuracy. It's about truth in the sense of trying to generate meaning from Torah through reading. So here, I think the takeaway from these two texts, because as we're going to see soon, the rabbis don't agree. They have a different name for Noah's wife, and that's going to launch us into the rest of this. Um, is that the, we see that the oral tradition, i.e., the way Jews were reading Torah, it wasn't something they ignored that Noah's wife didn't have a name. It was something they cared about. That's, I think, the takeaway from this. The takeaway from this is Lauren, in her genius, was not, I think we can, again, we see our genius in the sense that your question is not new. Your question is fully within the Jewish tradition, right? This question of what about Noah's wife, i.e., maybe an example of what about the presence of Jewish women in our history, in our tradition, is not something we are jamming into what it means to be a participant in Torah. It is a fundamental question of what it means to be a participant in Torah. And we see it as early as the Second Temple texts, and we will see it soon now as we enter the rabbinic material. Does that framing make sense? Okay. Again, and really the point here is that Torah is not something we receive passively. Torah is something we participate in. And, the, and in the words of my teacher um, from when I was in university, incredible point she made, one of my Bible professors, that the, bump, the road bumps in the text are there to generate our attention. It is not, I mean, God wrote the Torah and didn't write it, wrote it well, obviously. It's God. And the things in it that make us go, hold up, wait a second, are there to draw our attention and make us read more carefully. So here is an example. Noah's wife being a central figure of what it means to have a new world, a second Eve, right? a mother to a new world, not being named, should make us pay attention and should make us try to figure out what's going on here. Okay. Um, okay. So let's keep, so let's start looking now at the rabbinic tradition. Okay. So Vitsila, Gamhi Yalada et Tuval Kain Lotesh Kolchoresh Nehoshet Uvarzel. Viachot Tuval Kain Naama. Okay, so here we have an, uh, one of the first toll doses of the Torah, one of the first generations, genealogies of the Torah. It's nay it's 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 really interesting people. We'll get we'll dig into it soon. But it says Tsila Bor Tuval Kain, very interesting name. Don't let that name uh, pass you by. And he forged all implements of copper and iron, or brass, or bronze and brass, depending on your translation. And his sister was named Naama. Who is this Naama, you might ask? Aha. Rashi says, Naama, he ishto shel Noach. Naama, that's Noah's wife. End of class. We figured it out. That's, we've, now she, we, we did it. Just kidding. No, there's so much more to explore. Okay, so. Rashi says Naama is mentioned here. Why? Because she's Noah's wife. Now this obeys the rule of the Midrashic law of conservation of biblical characters. No one is mentioned for no reason. Everyone is mentioned for a reason. So why mention uh, Tuval Kain's sister? Why give her a name? Ah, that's telling us the name of Noah's wife. That fills in the Mad Lib. Okay. <laughs> So let's dig into this. Why is Naama the hook? Uh, and the question with Rashi, 
you know, ma kashela Rashi, right? What's well, bothering Rashi? But the other question for Rashi, because Rashi is more than being pshat in a way, Rashi is the marshalling of Midrash to be used for the sake of pshat. Right? Rashi is a digest of Midrash. He has his original comment sometimes, but the vast majority of Rashi is him quoting Midrash. It's the Midrash he thinks that best explain the Torah. Okay? So, this is the Midrash he's basing himself on. This is from Breshit Rabbah, which is from 4th century CE, uh, from, uh, from Palestine. Okay, it says, The Achos Tuval Kain Na'ama. The sister of Tuval Kain was Na'ama, right? Commenting on the verse. Rebbe Abba Bar Kahana says, Na'ama was Noah's wife. That's where Rashi gets that point from, okay? And here's the question now. Why? Why her? What's the road bump that makes Rebbe Abba Bar Kahana say, Ah, uh, Na'ama is Noah's wife and not somebody else? Why? Shah, um, because her name was Na'ama, Shahayu Ma'aseha Na'imim. Back to the point we said earlier, names are not just arbitrary in the Torah. Names tell us something. And we'll see how that's true about Noah later. All right, we got one more aside about Noah. We see how that's true about Noah later. But her name is Na'ama. Why? Because her deeds were Na'imim. Her deeds were pleasant. In other words, she was a righteous woman. Aha! Well, that solves the problem we saw before. Because the problem we saw before was, why is it that God said Noah was a worthy person who was worth of being saved, but didn't specify other people in his household were worthy of being saved? What if his children weren't? We see later that Ham does something awful. Right? Ham ends up sexually abusing his father in, a, at, least, in at least a some kind of way. So, it's not clear that his children are worth it. Ah, okay, here we have evidence that Naama, Noah's wife, was worthy of being re rescued. Why? Because she, too, had righteous deeds. Her deeds were lovely. Okay, so that's why she's Naama. And to drive the point home, she's mentioned here, and the point is more that her name is just tagged on at the end of this verse. And the sister of Tuval Kain is Naama. And the question you then should ask yourself is, new? Who cares? You tell me nothing about her. Right? You're just telling me her name. So the fact that you're telling me her name means her name matters. Her name is doing something. And what's it doing? Ah, she fills in the blank of the nameless Noah's wife. And we have a justification for the name, an etymology for the name, because an etiology for the name, because her deeds were pleasant, ni'imim, and thus, she's named Naama. Okay. But the rabbis give an alternative explanation, back to the point about how Midrash never likes to agree. Again, a very Jewish literature. It says, Naama cheretaita. No, this was actually a different Naama. A different Naama. Why was she called Naama? Mm -mm -mm. Because she was Naman Emet Bitofl Avodat Kochavim. Because she played the drums so groovily that people couldn't help but be seduced into idol worship. Okay. Now here's a question. It is ambiguous. When they say, no, this was a different Naama, do they mean? No, she was called Naama for a different reason, but she still was Noah's wife. Or are the rab or or is the second opinion saying this Naama wasn't Noah's wife? That's a real question. I think it's ambiguous. <laughs> what do you think? I understood it to mean that. She's that this is that Naama is Noah's wife, but she's not the one who's the Naama because she's pleasant, but she's a Naama because she tries to seduce people to idol worship, which really bugs me because, like, why do they have to diss on Noah's wife? It's bad enough she's not even mentioned. That's but a good point. Have... But Lauren, yeah, then why was she saved? So she, this couldn't have been that. That's what I was thinking. She could not have been this this terrible human being because she was saved. So she must be the nice Naama 
who may or may not, but probably is the sister of Tubal Cain, and she's Naama okay. because she did Dvarim Naamim. She did like nice things. Okay, good, good, good. So here we have the stakes. This is the stakes of the question. It needs to be the case by logical necessity that Noah's wife was good. Because if she weren't, she wouldn't have been saved. Right? I mean, I want to I want to add that as a proposition. Is that true? Do we agree with that? Or, you know, again, evidence by Ham really uh, doing something terrible down the road and even uh, you know, is it the case maybe that Noah's righteousness kind of carried his whole household with him? That's possible. That's possible. So do, I mean, and that kind of re-underscores the question in a way. When we talk about Naamah, are we really talking about Naamah? Are we talking about her man, right? Are we talking about her as an adjunct? Or is she somebody who has her own worth, her own substance, her own jam going on? So we have three possibilities. One, she was the good one. Two, she was the bad one, but Noah's righteousness took over. Three, this bad one wasn't Noah's wife. Okay? Those are the three options we have in front of us. And we're going to explore all of them. And in this way, the class is actually going to deviate from the mandate. It's not going to be about Noah's wife. All. It's going to be about Naamah. Who's this Naamah person? But by the end, and here I promise you, Blinetter, we will synthesize all of these with an incredible text that I was so jazzed to find. So that's, you know, no spoilers. But this is, it's going to, it's, what a journey we're going to be on, let me tell you. Okay, so. Here we go. But Josh, so we can I just ask, like, I just, yeah, I'm just wondering, though, like, already those three categories seem way too binary for how the Torah would think about good and evil in terms of, like, maybe she was doing, like, how do we categorize good and what's savable? And how do we say, oh, she's just beyond redemption and therefore should be wiped away in the flood? And so we're already like putting these categories in such polar opposites that there's nowhere for chuva and there's nowhere for nuance. So Okay. My first response to that is darn you and your insights. My second response to that is put a put a pin in that because it's going that will be very relevant in the synthesis that we're going to get to. And three, I think you're absolutely right that the that the Torah's account of the flood is, I mean, especially the version of it in which it's like, Noah was fine. But he wasn't great, right? In other words, he had to be like good enough. So maybe it's the case that she was fine and that was enough also to earn her a spot on the Ark. But if it's the case that she's literally contributing to dragging the world into idolatry, that might be, I think, a bridge too far. But I think that's a very, that's a very good point. I think let's... That having said, the Midrash tends to, in some ways on some ways subvert them, but in other ways really like kind of see things in a much more stark, kind of more mythic division. But I agree, there's, there is often like a grit in the oyster that, that causes a pearl. So let's, let's see how it, um, how it both, I think, schematizes, but also frustrates that, that schema. Um, so we have two names responding to the chat. There's Amtseret that we saw in the, uh, the Second Temple literature, but that's not that doesn't appear in the rabbinic literature. And the only name that we see given to Noah's wife in the rabbinic literature that I found at least was Naama. So the two options we have. So it, it could be the case that like, let's say this is a different Naama. Fine, so maybe I'm Sarah was right. Maybe that was her name, we don't know. Um, okay. So um, Ramban kind of like emphasized the stakes. It says, in, quoting Breshi Rab, it says, the Naama, which means that her deeds were lovely, and then the rabbis say that actually it was a different Naama. It's like very clear actually that it means that the rabbis think that this bad Naama, this idol to, to Ellie's point, this idolatrous Naama, this like wicked version, you know, Naama was bad. Um, so, and also, I mean, a very, I think very good point that Ramban brings up. I'm not, we're going to do this outside. It's, it's a little too long, but it says that this wasn't the one that Noah, um, then why is it then this is a very interesting point. So the rabbis meant to say that she was famous in those generations because she was a righteous woman and she gave birth to righteous children. Okay, fine. This was why scripture mentioned her, and that's why she's given the name Naamah in the verse 422. 
And here's a very interesting, and maybe this is to Ellie's point. And if, if so, a small remembrance of Cain, the world's first murderer, was left in the world. And that's if she's the good one. So here, and we're going to, I want to leave this one simmering on the back burner. But part of the, very, very good point, Ellie, that even if it's the case that she's the righteous one, it involves some kind of sense of moral complexity. Because she is the surviving remnant, and she continues whose line, right? We have Abel who's killed by Cain, and then Adam and Eve have a third kid who's the progenitor of Noah, Seth. But if Noah marries Achot to Valkain, who's Naama, then Cain's lineage is being brought into this new world. The cursed lineage of Cain. Might that explain, then again, Ham's misbehavior down the road? Perhaps. Um, there's a great uh, modern midrash, again, musical called Children of Eden. And I'm really, uh, mom's kicking herself she's not on this class right now because it's a musical by Stephen Schwartz. My mom loves Stephen Schwartz. Not, no relation. But it's a really, really fun kind of midrashic musical. And it, but the kind of the cosmic conflict is the, is the mark of Cain and, and, and Ham's bloodline. And it kind of spins this whole mythos out of it. So... Um, I'm going to mention another possibility, but we're going to actually put a pin in that until we get later. So let's focus here. Okay, so we have the stakes. The stakes are, Naama is either, and here I'm going to be a little bit simplistic, is either through the word Naimim, righteousness, loveliness, like that her deeds were good, or Naama is that her beauty was seductive, right? Either her musical. But, so it says that she played the drums so like well that like nobody could help but do the conga line to uh, worship Baal Pa'or or whatever. So uh, what's this idea that she was, that Naama here was a musician? So we start here with a morally neutral and even a, a positive account of that. So it says, Sila, uh, so here's the Targum Yehonatan. Has anyone heard of uh, Suda Jonathan? So you know what a Targum is? It's a fun word to say. Targum. Targum is a word that means translation. It is an ancient translation of the Torah, of the Tanakh. Um, most famous Targum is called Unkelus, written by, actually, one of our first most famous converts. Um, very interesting point, actually, that it's a, it is a convert, specifically, who translates the Torah into the lingua franca, into Aramaic, uh, to translate the Torah into the wider world. Um, another, the second most famous Targum is called Targum Yehonatan. It is written by a guy named Jonathan for Tanakh, but for Torah... It seems like it's given the name Jonathan. It's, it's not clear as written. So often people say it's Targum Pseudo-Jonathan. Um, but here we have Targum Yehonatan on Breshi. It says, this is a very, very old translation. Like older than, as older than Midrash. This is old. This is very old. It says, Sila afi yat tuval I'm gonna, it's Aramaic. I'm not going to make you guys listen through it. Sila also bore tuval kain. That's pretty, that's pretty clear. Master of all artisans who knew how to forge brass and iron. Okay, we saw that, right? Tuval kain was the master of artisanry when it came to metalworking. Okay? And the sister of tuval kain was Naama. And here we have, again, a gap. What was her deal? We just got her name in the Pasuk. But aha, the verse, is an expanded version of Genesis, not unlike the text we saw before. She was mistress of elegies and songs. So the I, Breshi chapter 4, especially, is what we can call a, like a cosmic history of the world. We have the titans of industry the masters of human civilization, the people who invented fundamental aspects of what it means to be a human being. What did Tuval Cain invent? Metalworking. All right? And we see another example of that. If we zip back a couple of psukim, it says, Ada, Ada bore Yaval, and he was the ancestor of those who dwell in tents and amidst herds. So what did Yaval create? Excuse me. What did Yaval create? These are the three brothers, Yaval, Yubal, and Tuval Kain. 
So what did Yaval create? Shepherds. Yeah, pastoralism. Exactly. Exactly. For, uh, shepherding. Um, and that's a very interesting point, right? Because what? how did God curse Adam? We're going to get into this later. How did God curse Adam when Adam sinned? What was the curse he gave him? Having to work, to work the land. Exactly. By the sweat of your brow, you will work the land. Okay, so that's agriculture. So Yaval innovated. He disrupted. Ugh, hate that language. Whatever. You have all innovated. The s human civilization is effectively farmers and shepherds. He invented shepherding. He's like, oh, okay. So it's going to be hard to work the land. What if I got animals to eat it instead? Right? So a whole new way of living life. Okay? And Yuval, who was Yaval and Tuval Kain's brother, what did he invent? He was the ancestor of all who played the lyre and the pipe. So it seems like he perhaps invented how to make a musical instrument. Okay? Yuval, and, but the, the lyre and the pipe are not made of metal. When we think of pipe, you probably might think of like a flute or something. Right, Renee? Wrong, Renee. It is a pipe mostly made, uh, probably made out of reeds. Right? A reed pipe. A shepherd's pipe. Huh? Right? Made out of wood. And a lyre is made out of wood, the frame, and guts, right? That's what strings used to be made out of. Uh, you know, famously cat gut, right? Is what made, was what, like, uh, violins are made out of. So you need the shepherding to have the animals, to slaughter the animals, and use every part of the animal like an ancient person, and I would say a sustainable person would, and use that to make the sinews, right? Use the sinews to make the strings. Okay, so we have it building, shepherding. And then using the products of agriculture and shepherding, wood and animal products, to make instruments. And now we get to Valkyne, who makes, who, who, who uses metal, right? Beginning of the, the Bronze Age, right? And then Naama, who combines it all, it doesn't just make an instrument, but plays it. She is the inventor of music. Right? According to Targum Yehonatan, he is emplacing her in the cosmic mythic history of the human civilization. She is not just a name. She's not just referred to. She has substance now. She, like Tuval Cain, is on equal footing because he was a metal worker and she used that to invent music. Zohar Chadash, which is a later text, but picks up on this thread and says, okay, Rabbi Isaac agrees with Rabbi Abau Bar Kahana and says, yes, why is he called Naama? Because she did good things, fine. Rabbi Abau says, the pshat of the text is that she was also an expert in working metal, like her brother. And how do we know that? Because Tuval Kain was the father of all bronze and brass work and his sister is Naama. Why does it say his sister was? It's not just that, but there's an extra vav here. And the extra vav means that she was an expert just like him, says the Zohar. She was an expert just like him. She has her own story. She has her own substance. And it takes the Targum and the Midrash to bring it to the fore. It is a reparative reading. right? It repairs what's missing. It's a tikkun, in a sense. Tikkun in the sense of perfection, a tikkun in the sense of developing something to achieve its fullest form. Okay, so here I give an example. Noah, my last reference to Noah. Noah was also part of this. Noah is part of this mythic history. He's one of the titans of industry. Why? It says, Vayikrad Shemo Noah. His name was Noah. Lemor, Ze Yenachameinu Mimaaseinu. Because he will comfort us from our toil. And from the, from the pain, the suffering of our hands, of like the work of our hands. From the land which God has cursed. Remember, God cursed the land, saying by the sweat of your brow, as a number of people here knew off the top of their head. Very impressive. Ten generations after Adam comes Noah. And at the end of this cycle, ah, the cycle's here too. At the end of that cycle, Noah contributes comfort. 
He brings comfort. Nechama. Naama. Nechama. Why? And remember also that the ayin is a guttural letter. So Nechama and Nechama. Very similar sounding names, interestingly. Why is he bringing comfort? How is he bringing comfort? Rashi cites a midrash saying, Yanach mimenu es itzfon yadenu. He brought rest and, and peace to the suffering of our hands. Ad shalova noach, before Noah, lo hayalahem clay macharesha. They had no agricultural implements. Vuechin lahem vayetala arts motziah kotsim adarim kshazarim zechitim. The land was full of, bar of, 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 of brambles and thorns, like the ones that like blinded Prince Charming and, sweet, and, and Sleeping Beauty. Because of the curse that God had laid at the foot of Adam, of Adam Arishon, but Noah's use of uh, uh, invention of agricultural tools, like a plow, right, a, a hoe, was then able to bring comfort to the human race by... Um, by not, I mean, think of it like literally. Actually, this is talked about by Georges Bataille, early 20th century French scholar of religion and philosopher, in his book Theory of Religion. the The story of human civilization is told by how far away you get away from the ground. Before they had agricultural tools, how were they planting crops? If the land was cursed with thorns and brambles, what were they using? Their hands. And then let's say, fine, they used a rock. But a rock isn't so big, right? Even with a rock, you're still going to get scratched up. So literally, the pain of their hands, they're digging up thorns, stabbing into their, their poor flesh. And Noah brings comfort by creating tools, effectively. And tools literally, physically distance us from the ground. So you can, the, the hoe is an extension of your arm or the plow or what have you, okay? So... Back to the point that, that Targum Yehonatan said, that she was the mistress of music. That's why it's heavy metal music, because metal and the music. Ah. Um, she was the mistress of music. Okay? How do we know that? Ah, Nachum Sarna has a beautiful book. I think used to, the book used to be called like Worship of the Heart, if I remember correctly, but now it's just called On the Book of Psalms, which is a much more boring title. Beautiful book on Psalms. But he says, the text records the birth of a daughter named Naama to Lamech. So Naama shows up elsewhere. Um, no, sorry, Lamech is the father of Yaval, Yuval and Tuval Kain. So also Naama. No accomplishment is ascribed to her in the Pshat. We saw that, fine. But since it is rare for daughters to be mentioned in the genealogies of the book of Genesis, it may be assumed that she was the subject of some well-known legend. When he says legend, what he means is oral tradition. It doesn't mean myth, doesn't mean falsehood. It means oral tradition, i.e., Torah as it's lived, not just Torah as it's read. I think something that really should be coming through in this class and something that's really important reversal of our book-obsessed culture. Oh, the Torah. The Torah is what's in between these covers, right? No. Torah has always lived in the air. Torah has always been embedded within Jewish life. Midrash is not pasted on top of Torah. Midrash is essential to Torah. Oral Torah and Torah were both given at Sinai. That is the foundation of rabbinic Judaism. That's our double revelation. We don't have a New Testament, but we also have a double revelation, written Torah and oral Torah, both given at Sinai. There is no Judaism without oral Torah. It does not exist. So, an ancient Jewish tradition fills in the gap. It holds her to have been a professional singer of religious music. That's the Targum Yehonatan we saw before. This is of interest for two reasons. The underlying root of the name Naama in Arabic and Syriac, Syriac is what the Pshita is written in, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dialect of Aramaic, and in some Hebrew texts means to sing. And the, amount, the account recognizes the great antiquity and high prestige of vocal and instrumental music, which it regards as one of the most noteworthy achievements of the human race. She has foundational place in what it means to be part of this early history of the human, of human beings, in that she invented Naama, invented music. <clears throat> um, how do we know? The word sing, chant, and the word ni'ima means tune. How do we know this? To whom can she be compared? As it says in Shmuel Bey's, 
Ve'ela divrei David acharonim, neum David ben Yishai, uneum hagever hu kam al Mashiach el loke Yaakov, uneim zimirot Yisrael. These are the last words of David, one of the most heartbreakingly beautiful chapters in the entire Tanakh. The utterance of David, son of Jesse, the utterance of the man set on high, the anointed of the, of the God of Jacob, Mashiach, Malach Mashiach, the favorite of the songs of Israel. Favorite, in my opinion, this I, I quoted the translation. It's not right. Naim means music. It doesn't mean nice. She's called Naama because Maasea Naimim means that her deeds were musical. This is one version of it. So one way of reading that midrash is that her deeds were righteous, and thus she was saved. Fine. Another way of reading that midrash is her deeds were ni'imim, i.e. she was the human inventor of music, renowned for her skills in music, all right, and, and singing songs. So besides it being just like a lovely tradition that I'm, I'm excited to outline, another aspect of this is to say this is not just saying, ah, Noah was cool, Noah did good, Noah's wife, sorry, Noah's wife was cool, she did good things. That's very bland, it's very generic. Noah's Ni'imim and Na'ama playing together in that way means that she was on equal footing with her siblings, contributing to the substance of human civilization. She had her own contributions. That's what, that's, that's what this, this take tax on. Okay. So here we get into the ambivalence of beauty. So music is actually a famously ambivalent topic for philosophers and ethicists. Music is something that, like we saw before, like her playing the drums, a version of the story. Naama playing the drums could seduce people, right, into idolatry. Think of the way that people freaked out um, when the Beatles played on Ed Sullivan. Right? All those swiveling hips, driving people mad. This is actually a story that keeps on happening, because that was true about Beethoven. Like, women were fainting when Beethoven would play chamber concerts, because of, and Mozart too, because apparently, like, the music was so sensuously, sensorily overwhelming, it carried you away. Right? So the notion of, like, the Pied Piper, right? Music as a seductive act means that what we have here is the ambivalence not just of music, but of beauty. Beauty, too, is something that is seen to both represent an ideal, right? I, I, because I declare beauty truth and truth beauty. It's an ethical ideal. Harmony, right? But on the other hand, a beauty is also seduction. A beauty is seen as a ambivalent, a liminal feature, something that brings you across a border, or something that could lead you to something, something that could in, in, uh, possess you, something to take you over, right? So here we have... Um, an example of this from Midrash Hagadol, which is a Yemenite Midrash. Ariel, I love that you asked where the where the text came from before. It's very important actually to think about where these texts come from. This is from a let's say from a medieval Yemenite text. One of the few texts we have actually coming out of Yemen proper. Very neat text. This is called Midrash Hagadol, otherwise known as Big Midrash. Uh, Midrash all the all the Midrash texts are called Big Midrash. Midrash Rabbah also means Big Midrash. All right, Midrash Hagadol, Big Midrash, uh, and it is uh, edited by Solomon Schechter famed early 20th century scholar, um, famed uh, father of the Cairo Geniza. Okay. So he says, Sister to Alkain was Na'ama. Lefi shayata na'a bioter, because she was really pretty. Great, fine. Ad shita'uba malachei hashares, such that she actually caused the uh, angels of the heavenly hosts to, uh, like a lovesick puppy, stray after her. Now, what? This is very surprising. This is very surprising. Um, now, we're going to look at this tradition soon, and you might be surprised to learn it's literally from the Torah. Um, but first, let's look at another Midrash. This is from Midrash Agada, another later Midrash, not quite as late as Midrash Agadol. It says, The Achotu Valkain Na'ama, Chazal Amru. Rabbi said, Na'ama, why is she called Na'ama? Because sheheni ima besof ma'asa, aha, they agree with Rabbi Abahu, Bar Kahana, that her deeds are the reason she called she's called Naama because her, the result of her deeds was pleasant. But why? 
because the angels wanted to dally with her, and she ran away. Now, this idea that angels um, have the hots for human women seems surprising, doesn't it? Yes, I agree with you. I agree. This would make a much more weird um, Shalom Aleichem. Right? Shalom Aleichem, Malachi Asharetz. Uh-uh, don't you look at my daughter. So, um, put a pin in it. We're about, we're about to, we'll see the verse soon. Did I wait? Where's the verse? Oh, stupid Josh. Stupid Josh. Okay, well, who's got their, anyone other Torah in front of them? Um... All right, well, I guess it's, it's quoted here. I guess I'll just put it right here. Source. This is how, this is how you make a source sheet, folks. 6-2. Great. Aha! Uh -huh. Excellent. By your uvenea lochima spinosa. Uh, no! <laughs> there we go. Wait, why is it all the way down here? Okay. By your uven... Mm. By your uvenea lochima spinosa adam. Kito votena. Stop it. Oh, you dastardly source sheet. Oh, what, what in the world? What is going on? Okay. Cool. Let's leave this here. Three versions. Stop it. The daughters of... Oh, my goodness gracious. Can someone do hold music? Okay. This better have worked. Oh, you're driving me nuts, source sheet. So I always download it. Let me tell you guys. All right. All right, whoever's got a Tanakh in front of them. Um, so the children of God which is a very surprising phrase to find literally in the Torah. This is one of the most baffling verses in the entire Torah. It says, The children of God saw the children of, of Adam, that they were hot, and they took them for wives. From all of them they chose, amongst the ones that they liked. Okay. Well, that's a verse. Is the entire source sheet now that verse just because it wants to rub it in? So this is what it's basing it on. This is what it's... Oh, there it is. Well, that's fun. Um, this is what it's basing it on. That we have a verse in the Torah that said, the children of God, which seems to refer to some kind of... I don't know. Divine creatures, angelic creatures. Who knows? The children of God decide to go couple with human women. Who were these human women? Well... According to the rabbis, it's Naama. Why? Because her name means that she's so pretty that the angels couldn't bear it. Now, um, we have a really, really interesting... Um, right, so the, the, the angels who fell from their holy place in heaven, this is like an early idea of like a fallen angel. It's really interesting. It's, so we see it in Pirkei Rebbe Eliezer, which is a 8th, 9th century uh, midrash from, from Palestine. I call it Palestine because that's what it was called at the time. Uh, it's called Syria-Palestine by the Roman Empire, and then by the Byzantine Empire, etc. So, Rabbi said, The angels who fell from their holy place in heaven saw the daughters, the daughters of the generation of Cain, aha, put the pin in Cain, walking around naked, with their eyes painted like harlots, and they went astray after them, and took wives from amongst them, as it said. And the sons of Elohim saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives, all that they chose. I guess I could have just read it from that source. I didn't need to do that whole thing with the, with the source sheet. Point being, according to this Midrash, the, uh, the hot lady was Naama. So hot, indeed, that she's even used in this later text uh, as an example of someone that can never be resisted. In the uh, addition to Tan Buber's edition of the Tanhuma in parts of uh, Chukas, it's, uh, I'll give the story quickly. And basically, it's a Job story. God sees Rabbi Matasyahu Matia Bar Harash, a purely righteous man, 
learning Torah, resisting all of the world's iniquities, etc., etc. And because Satan doesn't like to let people succeed, Satan goes up to heaven, asks God for permission to distract him, to, to test him. God says, this is just like Job chapter 1, sure, go for it. And what does he do? Ah, it's such beautiful. Rebbe Mayer, he was, uh, the radiance of his countenance shone like the brightness of the sun, right? He is like pure goodness. So Satan goes up and he says, great, I want permission to test him. So what does he do? He transforms himself into a beautiful woman. So beautiful, no one's ever seen him like that before. So beautiful, who does the Midrash compare him to? Naama. Naama becomes the reference point for a woman so beautiful, no one could ever resist her. Fascinating. And what does Rabbi Matya do? First, he turns away his face, and then Satan puts the beauty in front of his face, turns away his face again, and finally, he stabs out his eyes. Great story. Um, point being, Naama becomes a reference point for a woman of irresistible beauty. Um, right, so this is a question about whether angels have free will, angels have desire, whether these were angels or not is a big question. Um, I think what here we're entered into the more, let's call it, dynamic metaphysics of Kabbalah. That what we have here is a interplay between different kinds of superhuman, extrahuman, divine, demonic creatures. Um, and they are an extension, a reflection of something that is broken. Okay, so the human, the the angel, the Bnei Elohim, whoever they were, straying after human women, specifically in this case Naama, becomes also the germ, the seed, for a different tradition about Naama, which I don't want to go into too deeply. But Naama, and this is, I mean, it should be clear, right? The Naama, that's the version that's seducing angels, or perhaps, I mean, the version of it that she runs away before the angels could could couple with her, that's Noah's wife. The version in which she seduces the people to idolatry or seduces the angels, that's the non-Noah's wife version of Naama, right? That's the known, that's a different Naama side of the, of the equation. Okay, so here we have a famous mystical story that Adam before he had Eve, sorry, yeah, before there was Eve, in the twilight of the sixth day and the magical, mystical, liminal time when demons were created, right? This, and actually, in Pirkei Avot, it talks about all the things that were created in the twilight of the last day. That's where Lilith comes in to play. Lilith as the mother of demons. Lilith as the un, improper coupling between Adam and another consort. But Lilith is the famous one. Everyone's heard of Lilith. There's also Naama. So Naama in the Zohar isn't just a human character, is also a superhuman character who is the mother of demons. Adam had intercourse with female spirits for 130 days. These are actually the children of, uh, of Lilith in some stories, the, or Lilith's like gang, effectively, until Naama came. And that's actually, that 130 years is really important for a lot of interesting stories about Adam. And because of her beauty, mm -hmm -hmm, she led the sons of Elohim, Azah and Azael, astray. So she was the one who seduced these angels who then end up falling and, have to, and then are like condemned to earth. And she bore them all sorts of new kinds of klipa. She actually ends up generating, birthing evil in the world. So this is the way in which Midrash or Kabbalah doesn't just take something that's ambivalent, it turns the volume all the way up to 11. It really get it really heightens the stakes. And she ends up uh, then again, not just, um, not just, you know, it's not just that she seduces people into idolatry, she seduces angels, and then finally she actually ends up becoming a mother of demons. So that's the bad version of Naama. Okay. But again, we're left with, um, ah, that's a great point, Susie. So this is what one can call perhaps the, like, you know, a, 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 it's an example of, of the ambivalence of beauty. And the way the ambivalence of beauty, right, the way that human civilization has been both attracted to but also repulsed by um, or scared of beauty is often 
comes along with reactions to women. Right? Women as the object of male gaze, right? Of male of looking. And here, in a sense, what we have is this tension or this play between, I think, Na'ama as subject and Na'ama as object. That we have Na'ama as being seen as like a catalyst for something happening because of something in her nature, namely her beauty. And then that gets like heightened to become something that's actually about her wickedness. Or we have Na'ama as representing something virtuous. But what's hard to find, and this is to Ellie's point before, is the way in which actually woman especially is not positioned as being the gatekeeper of either good or bad. Right? Just a human portrayal. Are we trapped between Na'ama the perfect, Na'ama the righteous, and Na'ama the wicked sed seductress? Is there something that's more human or more complex that we can discover in this material as well? And that's going to take us to the final act of this year. What a wild story, though, right? We have our own Oedipus Rex story, which the rabbi stabs out his eyes. Pretty wild. And then, oh, by the way, when, when Satan sees, like, he's like, darn, this guy crazy. And he, like, leaves. <laughs> like, this guy. Too much, man. Um, all right. So here we get to the question of Cain. Um, so we mentioned before that she is the sister of Tuval Cain, which seems to be most likely a descendant of Cain. Or maybe not. Part of the question is, are we able to integrate the part of us we want to repress? That's how I want to reframe the question of Cain. Cain is the, the first bad, bad guy in the Torah. He does something terrible. But the story of Cain is, is more tragic than it is condemning. He ends up wandering the world for the rest of his days, Navinad right, in exile. But finally, he's able to create the first city. He has a child who he names the city after, named Chanoch, which means education. It seems like Cain's able in some way, perhaps, to make a new start, to find a way to start again, to live through and to process this primeval, primordial crime, and perhaps do tshuva. So the question is, and the question of tshuva, in a, re in a way, really is, are we able to integrate that which we wish we could repress? That which we repressed. Okay. So Naama is, not, is going to be central to this question of this, like, cosmic question of what, can, what do we do with the part of us that we wish we didn't have? So Tubal Kain, Rashi says. Why is he called Tubal Kain? Because Tovel Umanato Shal Kain because Tovel is related to his, to Kain's handicraft. So here we have the notion that Tuval Kain is not just Kain, is not Tuval Kain, but he's Kain. He's, he's a manifestation of Kain. Tuval is like the word Tavlin. You know what Tavlin means? Spice. Seasoning for food. Right, you see that appear a lot in rabbinic literature. Tibel vihit kin umanuto shal Kain. Gewalt. Tuval Kain refined and improved, enhanced, like what salt does to food, right? Salt is a, not a, it doesn't taste salty if you cook with it. Salt enhances flavor. Seasoning enhances flavor. So he enhanced, he made a tikkun, on kain. La'asot klei zayin la'rotzchim. Why? Because what did kain invent? weapons. And what does Tuval Kain do? He beats swords into plowshares. Tuval Kain takes the metal that could be used to, in, to inflict grievous bodily harm and instead uses it for creative human purposes. Tuval Kain means the one who brought Tikkun to Cain through his, his creativity. It's an incredible reading. 
But as we saw before, achoto shall kutu akain. Naama is part of the story as well. Naama is one of the three siblings, is one of these this family of four siblings. Yuval, Yaval, and Tuval Kain. Tuval Kain, another way of reading it. So one way of reading it is that he brought Tikkun to Kain. Another way of reading it is that he made Kain's murder even worse because he enhanced it. He's like, great. Kain probably killed somebody with a rock or with a fist. I'm going to create swords. I'm going to make weapons now. So he ends up becoming like Northrop Grunham, Gunham or whatever that, um, whatever the, the, the weapons dealer is called. He's, um, he's uh, uh, Tony Stark before he does Chuva. Although his doing Chuva is to create a huge weapon suit of armor. So it's not really doing Chuva. But the point is that he's, um, he's creating weapons. So you, Tuval Kain is furthering the work of Kain. Yaval, though, is righteous. Yoshev Ohalim, dwelling in tents, like Jacob. And, and Yuval was also righteous, because he did similar stuff. So we have two wicked brothers, one, uh, sorry, two good brothers, one wicked brother, and we have three sons of Noah, two good, one bad. Um, so Naamah, um, according to this, was the source of the bad one. That's why, if it was just Noah's kids, if he could have had kids by himself, says the Sif Chachamim, which is a uh, super commentary on Rashi, then all three kids would have been good if he had had three kids. But coming out of um, Naamah, it was a two to three ratio. Two good, one bad. Again, here we have, in a sense, an intolerance, an, in an inability to tolerate Kain's presence in our life. That Kain coming through Naama, through the family, means it has a bad result. So in that account, there isn't Tshuva, because it's an enhancement of Kain. Tuval Kain continues Kain. Kain never dies. Kain never grows. But again, we saw here before that this Tikkun can also mean perhaps to repair. And we'll see that come back soon. So is it the case that because we have something bad in our history, because we have something, because we have something like kind, right, that it's in that we're not able to integrate it? The Sefer Yashar, which is also a late midrash, says, at the end of many years, Sila, the mother, became old, and God remembered her, and she conceived and bore a son, and called his name Tuval Kain, saying, after I have withered away, I obtained pleasure and joy. Um, may, uh, oh, no, sorry. That is an incorrect translation, and I'm frustrating that it gave, frustrated gave it to me. And he called the name Tuval Kain, saying, after I have withered away, I have created him with Kel Shaddai, with God. And it's the same language that Eve uses when Eve bears Kain. It says, Kinitiu im Hashem. I have created him with God. So, Tuval Kain is the same thing, but it's after Beloti, that's the thing, after I am old. Now, and then she has a, a daughter, calls her Naama, why? Achare Beloti, after I have withered, after I've grown old, I have now pleasure and joy. So Naama here is seen not as just identified with Kain, but Naama is, again, has her own substance, her own sense of self, and it is a counterbalance to Kain. It is... Her, she is providing na'ama not just in a not just in a way in being an object of desire, not just you know being someone that's seducing angels. She provides comfort and joy for her mother. She provides it. It's not just as an object, it's a subject. Okay. Here we come to a very fascinating, in my opinion, a very a fascinating climactic text, but I want to I want to present how it is, and then we'll have a little time to chat. So the, the, the scandal here is the scandal of Kain. But really, in a way, it's the same scandal we have as the question of Naama. And it's the same way, in a sense, as trying to find a place for, let's say, the marginalized character in Torah. When the marginalized character is brought back to the center through Midrash, 
can only be done as an instrument of what we need them to be. A gatekeeper of good, a gatekeeper of bad. Or is there a way to allow this person, this character, to have a more complex, full humanity? And I think that question is played out nicely in this question of Cain. That Cain is somebody who did something terrible and then lived a life. And the question is, is this person a character or is this person a person? If it's a character, it represents something bad. It's the mythic representation of murder, right? The one who invents murder, the one who invents weapons, the one who invents this, who invents that. Superhuman characters. Or is this person a person? Someone who grows, who reflects, who regrets, who changes, who does, in Ellie's very proleptically perceptive language, tshuva. Reb Tzadok of Lublin was a late 19th, early 20th century Polish Hasidic rabbi from Lublin. And in one of his Divrei Torah from Shabbos Shuva, he writes, and then the whole question, the whole Divrei Torah is about whether Cain did Shuva or not. And that's the question. Could Cain, this mythic enemy, this mythic villain, is his line cursed? Or is he the first Balchuva? This is what we found with Cain. Emes, in truth. Ho il tshuva so. His tshuva was accepted. Di Isa. How do we know that Cain did tshuva? This is incredible. As it's brought in the Midrash. Naama ishto shel Noah chaita. Naama. Who was she? Noah's wife. And, to, and, and Reb Tzadok Cohen says, and it's not clear, if, like, he might have this, it's, it, in the text itself, it seems like it just flows right into it, but it's not in the Midrash. He adds this himself. He says, V'yatsa mimena kol ha'ulam. The entire world came from her. And Abraham and the entire Jewish people. That's the proof that Cain did tshuva. What's the proof? Because if he didn't, then she couldn't have been the one who survived. It's proven that people are people, that people are persons, that persons are human beings that change and grow and reflect and regret because she is the proof for that. She birthed an entire new world. And that would have been impossible if it weren't possible for people to change. I think it's not irrelevant that that question ends up re-arising uh, at this exact moment in human history when an entire civilization has been scotched. God looks at them, sees, you know what? Give yachol, I regret it. Wickedness has taken over the land. I need to re do a hard reboot and start again. In comes the flood. Human race restarted. And then who is it then who starts the human race? Ah, of course, it's Noah, the righteous, the most righteous person alive. But it's not just Noah. It's Noah and his family. What kind of story would it have been if it's like, oh, and who do we restart the human race with? A perfect person. Because that's the only way that I can restart the human race. No. It has to be not just Noah, who may or may not have been good or good enough, but Naama, who comes from a line of persons who, who, who made mistakes, who reflected and grew, and who moved forward. Naama was the one who was needed to restart the world, because what was missing from the world, part of the programming, was tshuva. 
Cain did tshuva, but that was a one-off affair. Tshuva needed to be literally in the DNA of what it meant to have a sustainable world. God puts the rainbow in the sky and says, when you look at that, know that I will not again bring this catastrophe, this cataclysm. But the point of that isn't saying, I'm going to let you off scot-free. The point is rather, I am going to let you take the time that you need to grow and change. Naama ends up becoming, in this way, not the... I think the most powerful reading of the, of the recovery, the re reparative reading of Naama, isn't that she was also a righteous person just like Noah, few good, but rather that she was somebody who brought goodness to the world, as it says about her mother in Sefer Yashar, and also in her deeds she enacted goodness, and also I mean, that's what it says, ma'aseh na'imim, her deeds were good. It's not that she was eshes tzedekes, but that her deeds were good. What it means to rebuild a world with your hands. But secondly, that she is, her existence was necessitated by the fact that tshuva exists. Because if it weren't for tshuva, it couldn't have been her. That she is not just the mother of a new world, but the mother of a world that can grow, mother of a more sustainable world. Um, and I find that immensely powerful. Uh, thank you so much to Lauren uh, for suggesting the topic. Thank you so much for everybody. I'm going to stop recording now, uh, but we'll also have a chance to have a little bit more uh, informal chat for a couple minutes before we part. But um, we'll be having shop, uh, we'll having the return of Kabbalat Shabbat on Zoom tomorrow evening at set at five forty five. I want to say, I forget. Um, Havdalah also on Zoom uh, Saturday night six something, uh, seven something, um, seven something, and um, Shabbat morning service is nine thirty. A um, bunch of people are out of town, so we need we need we need we need people. So please tell your friends, especially if they happen to be men. Um, and uh, we'll be bringing back, um, we'll bring Parsha, Parsha class every Thursday evening, so I uh, hope to see you again in a week. And also um, in November, um, we'll be having uh, also more thematic learning. We'll return when I have a chance to do a little bit of research. So if you have some uh, mini-series you want me to tackle, please uh, shoot me a message, and I'm happy to, um, to contemplate that. Also, the, uh, the year of Shemitah, I also want to give a lot of attention to the Earth. So there will be a number of classes about uh, to Earth. So um, thank you all so, so much for joining. Shkoyach to everyone on the YouTube. And uh, stick around if you're in person because we can chat for a little bit. Uh, Shkoyach.